The City of Bristol, providing beautiful parks, economic development, and a family-friendly community. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the regular joint meeting of the Board of Finance and City Council for January 14th, 2020. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Would the members of the joint meeting please introduce themselves, starting on my far left. Mary Fortier, City Council. Jay Carrier, Board of Finance. Marie O'Brien, Board of Finance. Freddie Barney, City Council. Peter Kelly, City Council. Scott Rosado, City Council. Greg Hahn, City Council. Ron Burns, Board of Finance. Cheryl Tebow, Board of Finance. Nick Jones, Board of Finance. Orlando Kelfi, Board of Finance. And I am Mayor Ellen Zappo Sasu. The first item on our joint meeting agenda is the consent calendar, items 2A through D. Are there any items that any member of the joint meeting would like to remove for discussion? Hearing none, is there a motion for the consent calendar? Second. Any further discussion? Carrying none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item three is to transfer $10,000 from the general fund contingency account to the deferred comp consultant. Any discussion? Carrying none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item four is to make an additional appropriation of $5,000 within the Special Grants and Donations Fund, funded by a transfer in from the general fund for the city match of the Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank Grant. Move approval. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Your Honor, can we also get the approval of the minutes, the first one? I always miss that. <laughs> Um, approval of the minutes of the regular joint meeting on December 10th, 2019. Any discussion on the minutes as presented? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, back to item five. Monthly revenue and expense report presentation by our controller, Diane Waldron. Good evening, everyone. Um, you have the report through the end of December in front of you. Um, again, I'm just going to highlight the major revenue um, components of the city budget that uh, has been doing very well over the last uh, six months. Um, I did highlight tax revenue. Right now we're at 66.4 percent of the um, tax, current tax collections through December, uh, which compares to 56.3 percent in the prior year, which means about 17.9 million came in more at the end of December compared to the uh, 2018. Um, a lot of that could just be when the escrow payments come in. Sometimes they come in a little bit earlier um, in December or right at January 1st, depending on the timing. Um, the only good thing with that right now is it's uh, more investments for us to have for the month of January. So I think that's, um, that's a very positive thing that we received that much more at the end of December. Um, the prior year tax revenue collections, again, those are coming in much better than they were in the prior year at $156,000 more. And again, as I reported at the last meeting, you don't see anything for the motor vehicle supplement yet um, on the December report. We will be collecting that in January, so hopefully in the January report you will see that. Um, the billings on that were 2.28 million compared to 1.4 million that was budgeted. Um, building permit revenue is coming in strong. We're at 75% of the budget. And conveyance fees are at 70.7% of the budget. Last year it was at 57% and investment earnings are already at 74.3%. So um, those uh, four main areas are doing very well. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, we did receive um, the, um, the revenue loss for the manufacturer's grant. Uh, we received 65,900 of that grant. Um, we did not budget that. We were not anticipating that, that, budget, that we would be getting that grant. So that again is additional revenue. And depending on how the state 
what happens, we may get a little bit more on that. Our total grant approved was 162,000, but it was one of those grants that was had to be allocated and proportioned according to the state budget. So right now we only have 65,900 in that grant. A um, couple of other things that I do want to mention. Um, I know I was have been giving you updates on the audit. I think everybody received the audit at least electronically, and I think the city council did receive the hard copies. And I think Board of Finance will get them at their meeting in uh, in two weeks. Um, the audit. We did get an unmodified opinion, um, which is good. It's a clean opinion. Um, it was dated December 19th, and we finally received it on December 24th. Uh, one of the issues that I was telling you about, we had an issue with the, we had new actuaries, so we had the, um, some of the, the governmental accounting standards reporting that had to be done, had to be, uh, we were waiting for the actuaries to complete that report. So that was the main thing that held up the report, and hopefully next year that will not be the case. Um, the staff worked really hard to have the audit to the auditors, all the numbers done. We were essentially done right after Thanksgiving. So hopefully next year that we're, we're gonna push that date up um, even earlier. Um, the Board of Finance meeting um, in February, the February 25th meeting, if anybody's interested, um, the auditors will be there to make a presentation and go over the audit results. Um, there was no management letter, which I'm pleased to report. Um, we were very happy that, that it, was a, it was a good um, audit. Um, department budgets are due this Friday. Uh, we've been receiving some of the smaller ones um, since last week. Uh, the Comptroller's Office had their first budget review this morning with the fire department, and that went well. Um, and we were trying to convince the fire chief to come back and present it to the Board of Finance, but I don't think we were successful in convincing him to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but that went well this morning. So we will be meeting with the Board of, um, all of the other boards and commissions um, as we go forward over the next couple of weeks. Um, well, I am pleased to report that we did receive today um, notification from Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA, that we did receive the budget award for our 1920 budget. So um, I want to thank my staff. I think I mentioned this a couple of months ago, but they worked really hard to make some changes to the budget document. And when I was looking at the results and the comments this, from last year to this year, we received a lot of outstanding comments and, than we did the prior year before. So I want to thank um, Skip Gillis, Jody McGrain, Sharon Cheka, and um, Robin Manuel for all the effort that they went to make some positive changes to the budget document. And with that, that's all I have. Any questions on anything? Questions from anyone? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Diane. Okay. So, before we adjourn, our city council meeting will be starting in approximately six minutes. Uh, I think for joint meeting member purposes, as well as the people who are already here tonight at our city council meeting, we will be officially retiring and saying goodbye to Fire Chief Jay Kalkowski, who's with us tonight with his family. But before we adjourn and reconvene, I did want to invite everyone into the hallway for some light refreshments, get some sugar before our city council meeting, have an opportunity to talk to Chief Kalkowski, and we will reconvene promptly at 7 p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the January City Council meeting. I'd like to ask that you stand and please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to ask the members of the City Council to introduce themselves, starting on my far right. Greg Hahn, District 1. Scott Rosado, District 1. Peter Kelly, District 2. Brittany Barney, District 3. Mary Fortier, District 3. And Councilman Dave Proleski is unable to be with us tonight as he is still on vacation. The first item on our agenda is our moment of reflection. I'd like to ask everyone to take a moment to think about our troops serving in the Middle East as well as those here still in the United States who are currently on active alert, as well as the people of Australia. Thank you. 
Our second item of opening ceremonies is to recognize the career of Chief Jay Kalikowski from the Bristol Fire Department, who is ending 35 years with the department on Friday. I'd like to ask Jay to come forward, who's here tonight with members of his family. We also have in the audience several members of the Fire Commission that are in the back, and we also have Commissioner Emeritus Don Gornson with us. I'd like to recognize the Chief on behalf of the City Council and also the Fire Board, which I also chair, by entering into the record a proclamation as part of tonight's proceedings in recognition of his retirement on Friday. Whereas Chief Kalikowski began his career serving the citizens of Bristol as a paramedic at Bristol Hospital in 1980, and in February 1985 became a firefighter. Jay worked his way through the ranks with promotions including Lieutenant in 1991, Fire Captain in 2003, Deputy Chief in 2007, and was promoted to the rank of Fire Chief in 2015. And whereas during his tenure, Jay received commendations for outstanding performance during a motor vehicle accident in 2001, another for a serious auto extrication in 2004, and another for a meritorious service at a structure fire in September 20, 2013. And whereas under his leadership, the Bristol Fire Department has continued to meet the emergency response needs of the community, and whereas his countless hours volunteering hands-on at community events by serving and working be beside his staff, and whereas, on behalf of the entire City Council, we wish to express our sincere appreciation to Chief Kalikowski for his loyalty to the Bristol Fire Department and the citizens of Bristol. Now, therefore, we, the members of the Council, do hereby commend and honor Jay for his 35 years of service to the Bristol Fire Department and congratulate him on his well-deserved retirement and wish him many continued years of happiness and good health. And on Friday, it will be known as Jay Kalikowski Day in the city of Bristol to coincide with his last day of service. In witness thereof, I have hereunto signed my name and caused the great seal of the city of Bristol to be affixed this 14th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2020. So, yeah. Earlier tonight, we had a special fire board meeting to take care of various administrative issues related to the chief's retirement and other pieces of business within the fire department. And prior to that meeting, as he arrived with his wife, we had every active member on duty tonight lining the hallways, standing at attention in recognition of his years. And I'd like to thank the Bristol Fire Department for that as well. It was a very special night, and I'd like to now cede the floor to Chief Kalikowski for some comments. Well, thanks so much, Mayor. Um, I'm glad you mentioned earlier this evening with the, uh, all the firefighters lining both sides of the hallway. Uh, it was such a moving experience that uh, I think I want to pull my retirement papers down. <laughs> I had no idea they felt that way about me. But uh, no, that was a very moving experience and uh, I was overwhelmed, totally overwhelmed by it. And I want to thank everybody that put that together. Um, it's just something special and something I can't put into words. And, uh, don't want to get emotional, so I'm going to move on. So this whole thing started for me about 48 years ago. Um, not the fire department so much, but uh, my love affair with Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto. Back in the uh, show Emergency, believe it or not, back in 1972. Um, you know, who would have known that that would have led me down this path, but actually that's the exact moment in time that I knew that this is what I was going to end up doing. And it's just crazy when I think about it so long ago. Uh, from my early days as an EMT in Plymouth Volunteer Ambulance to my time as a paramedic at Bristol EMS uh, to my segue as a firefighter in the Bristol Fire Department in Febru on February 3rd, 1985. Uh, it's been one heck of a ride. Everybody goes through ups and downs, but when you're in the career of firefighting, uh, the highs are extremely high and the lows are, can be extremely low. And it is a, a real roller coaster ride during that tenure. It really is. And the people that you saw there this, this evening, if you were here earlier, they go through that on sometimes hour to hour basis, day to day basis, week to week basis, whatever it is. But like I said, it's it's a true roller coaster ride. 
Well, this is it. Uh, my 35 years in the Bristol Fire Department is coming to an end on Friday, like the mayor said. Um, sometimes it feels like only yesterday when I started this, but uh, my career has actually spanned over five decades now with the fire department. It was a lot different back then when I first came on, as you can imagine. Uh, we didn't have fancy equipment or gear. We were wearing hand-me-down long coats and three-quarter boots at the time. And that's when what I consider the end of the romantic age of firefighting was coming to an end. We were still riding in convertible trucks. Those are the trucks that don't have roofs on them. Uh, we were still using Rockwood Navy nos surplus no nozzles regularly in inch and a half hose. Um, box alarms still came in over the telegraph tape system where it would just click on the tape and the bells would ring in unison and it would tell you or signal to you where the fire was located or where the box was coming in from. And those are what I consider the, the good old days. Um, officers and veterans back then were looked upon a lot differently. They were revered, feared, respected um, for a number of reasons. But I have to thank every one of them that I worked under and had, had a chance to at least get to know for what they've done through me throughout my career. Um, legendary firemen like Jack LaFrance, Henry Gaskin, John Schilling, um, Francis Murphy, Jerry McGinney, Gary Reed, I mean, that's just to name a few of them, were the real smoke eaters. They were the real heroes back then. And um, those guys and the guys that came before them were the guys that made the job what it is today. And that's something that I always remind our people today is what they gotta embrace is the past and, and how we got to where we are today. It wasn't always like this. We didn't always have this great gear and great trucks and, and uh, the best of everything. Um, I'm honored to have worked with those guys, um, and I keep saying guys because it was firemen back then, um, and I'm humbled to say that I rode on their coattails to get to this point. Although I was born and raised in Terryville, I'd like to thank my adopted hometown of Bristol. Bristol is where I met my wife, where we got married, where we bought our first home, which we're still living in, our starter home, uh, <laughs> which we grew out of and grew back into. Um, we had two children, Allie and Matt, in that house. Uh, they went to Bristol schools. Um, they live in neighboring towns at this point, but Allison's a, uh, a teacher at Chiplets Hill Middle School. My son Matthew works for Simsbury Public Works, but is also a captain in Tuxus Hose Volunteer Fire Department. So that lineage is uh, still intact as far as the, the fire industry is concerned. I'd also like to especially thank my other family, the family in the fire department, um, for what they've done for me. They gave me the chance and the opportunity to rise through the ranks, to become chief of the department that I love, and I wouldn't have traded anything for the world. Um, inevitably, when people find out that you're a fireman, the first thing they ask you is, what was your worst call and what was your worst day on the job? Well, we're not gonna talk about my worst call for obvious reasons, but my worst day on the job, and it's gonna sound strange, was the day that I was promoted to deputy chief, believe it or not. You know, a great day for sure, but it was the saddest day of my job. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that day when I realized that I was never gonna be part of a crew again. I was never gonna ride on a truck. And I was never gonna stretch a hose line into a burning building again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've missed all those things over the last 13 years. I'll always miss those things. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the adrenaline, which is awesome. And uh, although I'm retiring as chief in a couple days on Friday, I'll always consider myself a fireman first and foremost. That's what's in my blood. I've also missed the camaraderie, camaraderie of working on the line. The feeling that comes from being part of a team after winning a big game. Um, I miss the legendary firehouse meals. Some are legendary for good reasons, some are legendary <laughs> for bad reasons. Um, I miss the unbelievably creative pranks, uh, the nonstop, good-natured, well, we'll call it banter, if you will. Um, but I have to say, the city of Bristol should be very proud to have such a group of highly trained professional firefighters. As a matter of fact, highly trained professional first responders through all ranks of the first responder uh, business, if you will. Um, it, 
we have a great crew in the city. We really do. I'm proud of them, and you should be proud of them as well. And I know it's been my honor and pleasure to serve alongside of them for all these years. Most importantly, I want to thank my wife, Kathy, and my family. Uh, none of this would have been possible without their love and support. Kathy and my children, Allie and Matt, were always there during the good times and the bad. Tonight's a good time. And they're here tonight, like I said. Um, back in the day, Kathy would bring the kids for firehouse visits during those marathon shifts when you're gone for days on end, um, or on Father's Day when you can't be there for Father's Day, or birthdays, or holidays. You know, that's the life of uh, an emergency responder. You know, you're not always home for all the special occasions, but she would have them at the firehouse so we could all share in that. Uh, she would also pack them up in the car in any weather at all and show up at uh, fires to watch us in action. And I would, <laughs> I would bet that my kids have been to more structure fires than half the guys on the job today. <laughs> um, they were always there. Uh, they were also voluntold, if you will, to uh, help me in all the things I got in, involved with, with the fire department, all the extracurricular activities, whether it was MDA, the, the anniversary, it, it didn't matter what it was. They were always willing participants and I know they thoroughly enjoyed it. They, they embraced it as much as I did. Um, my only real regret is that um, my wife never had the opportunity to pin a badge on me at a promotional ceremony. Uh, both of my children were able to do that when I was promoted to the rank of captain and deputy chief and I was saving the chief's penny for her. Uh, for reasons beyond my control, there was never a for no formal pinning ceremony when I became chief. As a matter of fact, my whole swearing in consisted of me visiting Therese in, uh, across the counter in the city clerk's office and swearing in, and that was it. Pretty unheralded and uh, not what I had pictured. So, although it's not the same, I'd like to have my cat, wife Kathy come up, and I'm gonna make her probably cry and I'm gonna get in trouble for this. But I'm gonna finally give her a chance to uh, pin my chief's badge on my uniform. There's, there's not a, uh, I don't have an oath to swear other than the oath of marriage that we took so many years ago. Um, and it may not be the start of a new chapter in my career, but it's definitely the start of a new chapter in our lives. So come on up. Or, or you can take it off, whatever you want. That's easy. You want to take it off or put it on? This has got to be PG people, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and, and that's really all I have to say. I actually have a lot to say, but uh, I know how these meetings go, and I know you don't want to be here any longer listening to me. But I wish all of you nothing but the best. I thank you all for everything you've done for me in my career, the support you've given the fire department. I hope that continues, and I'm sure it will. Um, and I, I just always implore people at the end of my letters and everything, just stay safe, stay safe out there, okay? And if you can't stay safe, uh, call us. We'll, we'll take care of it for you. Um, that's it. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to continue with our agenda and move on to the approval of the minutes of the regular city council meeting on December 10th, 2019 that were transmitted electronically. Does anybody have any comments or concerns? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. For public participation, we are going to ask um, first, if there is anybody who came late that did not get a chance to sign up on the sheet. Okay, before we move into our nonprofit spotlight, I would just like to recognize that we have visitors from abroad. We have Jack O'Brien in the back who may be our youngest uh, attendee from Italy visiting us this week, visiting his grandparents, Tom and Marie O'Brien. Welcome, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the nonprofit spotlight tonight is shining a spotlight on the Bristol Public Schools and some partnerships that Larry Cavino from Adult Education and I have been talking about that I think is of interest to many of our departments where we'll be doing referrals following his presentation as another way to cement the relationship between City Hall and our education system, specifically what's happening down on Redstone Hill Road. Larry. Good evening all. We're looking to establish a program that would allow our high school students to explore different career opportunities in conjunction with the city. So the State Department of Labor and the State Department of Education has a program called the Unpaid Experiential Learning Program, which allows our young people from ages 14 through the end of high school to participate in up to 120 hours of basically what is considered job shadowing. And when I first learned about this program, first started thinking about it, I immediately thought of some of our Bristol students who lack the opportunity for these types of programs. And I met with the mayor and I thought, wouldn't it be great if they could learn what our, some of our Bristol workers do here in town? Uh, so she and I met and we talked about some different opportunities and right away she started identifying different supervisors within different programs that she thought would be really good um, individuals to partner up with one of our high school students. So what we're looking at is to run a pilot program this spring with anywhere from five to ten students who would spend four or five hours for a couple of days during the spring with some of our folks from Public Works, um, from maybe Fire Department, Police Department, City Hall, our, our uh, IT folks, um, Parks, maintenance. Parks, and, Parks and Rec and Maintenance, Water Department, and one of the barriers that we have for many of our students is transportation. And the first thing that came to mind is the Park and Rec guys and the guys that are on the road there in the day. And, um, and when the mayor and I met, uh, I asked her, I said, you know, would it be possible for them to swing by our school over on Redstone Hill Road, pick up a student in the morning, they start at 7.30, and take that student for the morning, drop them off at lunchtime, um, and allow them to see what these folks do during the day. Uh, they do receive training uh, with regards to what they can and can't do. They're really observing. They spend the majority of the time observing, but we do go through, we're mandated by the Department of Labor to take them through a training program. Um, and the way we kind of envision this going is we want volunteers from the city, and, th and that includes folks from the Board of Ed. We've got carpenters, we've got electricians, we've got plumbers that are out there doing um, great work every day. And allow these folks to see what it is, see the different opportunities that are afforded them right here in their own city that are available. Uh, in the hopes of igniting a fire, uh, the chief talked about uh, the program back in the 70s, and I remember I watched, I watched that. Um, and you know, hopefully we can ignite something for our young folks here. And like I said, this would be a pilot program in the spring. We would evaluate it when it was over, over summer, and expand it, continue it. Um, we'd like to include the other two high schools so we'd have high school students getting this opportunity. It's covered by the Department of Labor and by the Department of Ed. Um, so there's, there's no cost to anybody. There's no liability to anybody. Um, it's all covered through them. We've already put in the application. It's already been approved by the Department of Ed and the Department of Labor. We're just looking now for the council's permission for the mayor to sign this agreement uh, and then start to reach out to some of our folks in our community who work for the city and see if they'd be willing to have a young person sit with them for a few hours. Any questions? Questions from the council? What I envision happening is tonight we'll make a motion to refer to the appropriate policy boards for their review. We'll, rev we'll refer to the corporation council for their review for liability, but just so everyone knows, this program already exists in the high schools where high school students are able to shadow. Specifically, I'm aware of the fire department. There may be others. So we have a model that we can build on as well as the added assurance that we're getting from partnering with the DOL program. <clears throat> then the third piece of that motion would be to authorize me to sign the agreement. Councilman Barney. 
Oh, um, I can make the motion. I just wanted to say thank you, though, for finding this for our students. I know I have family that lives in Westport, and it's always amazing to me the opportunities that um, their children have had from being so close to New York and things like that, where they can do these partnerships really young, school age. And so I haven't heard of something like this before for Bristol, so I'm just excited that you brought it forward. And I did not jot down what the mayor was talking about with the motion. I'll do so. the motion, don't Yeah, me. thank you. And this also aligns with our goals as a council about Bristol jobs for Bristol people as a Absolutely. first opportunity. And I think that this is something that will definitely jumpstart that and make people aware of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for taking charge and doing this. I think it's exciting. So the appropriate motion would be something like a motion to authorize the mayor to sign all necessary agreements to refer the matter of the Bristol Public Schools unpaid experiential learning program to the various policy boards for review and to also review to send the matter to the Corporation Council for review as well. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? I see that you have other members of the Board of Ed. We have Dr. Carbone and... Ms. Fortin is here as well. Is anything, are they just here to support you? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll get you copies of those motions and we'll tell you what those next steps are. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Again, last call. Did anybody come in late and miss the sign up sheet for public participation? Moving on to announcements, I'd like to ask Marie O'Brien, who has served as the chair of the Sessions Task Force, to come forward and address the council regarding the report that she would like to present. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Sessions Task Force and to report on this very first step in the remediation and the redevelopment of Bristol Sessions building on Riverside Avenue. And you will recall that you appointed the task force in September. So for the last three months on a bi-weekly basis, we've been meeting. And we have appreciated this uh, opportunity to serve our city to benefit this project and, and residents and taxpayers. So in this initial process, the Sessions Task Force learned about current trending public-private partnerships that are the most successful in utilizing these historic properties to address varied housing demand, urban housing demand in particular. In fact, we were interested in knowing that both the cities of Meriden and Manchester have just such partnerships between private real estate developers and what had been the more traditional municipal public housing authorities, now evolving property experts. These are versatile housing partnerships not unlike any other real estate developer, investor, or a financier, continuously monitoring trends in market demands. So the task force was interested in learning how these public-private partnerships were creating new potential that would enhance the value of historic properties, as well as increase revenue to the city to benefit taxpayers. So let me first reintroduce you to the task force. Obviously, I served as chair and was honored to be designated with that responsibility. Um, Bob Passamano was also a member, Mike Mazzarelli, Bill Machetti, and also Tom Hislop. So Tom is with me here tonight, and Tom is with ESPN. The combination of the several of us with our expertise in new construction, in zoning, in finance, in environmental remediation, in utility issues, and the maintenance of buildings and properties was really dynamic. As a group, we were able to bring this professional expertise to uh, bring forward the best inquiries on each of the proposals. I will be remiss if I don't mention to you your own professional staff. And so I know they are here. Roger Russo, Purchasing Department, Justin Malley, Economic Development, Corporation Council, the mayor, excuse me, the mayor, Arthur Bogan of the Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank, and special thanks go to Don Ledger, Don Nielsen, and our recording secretary, Christine Cooper. You have the report. You know that we received four qualified proposals. We reviewed each proposal. We conducted due diligence addressing each topic, each subtopic 
across all proposals simultaneously in a fair and equitable analysis. We conducted multiple iterations so that we could learn more about the building and the site. The task force, however, did focus considerable attention on affordable housing options. And so you will not be surprised to know that in terms of subsidized affordable housing units in the city, the, those units now comprise about 13.35% of all available units in the city. This is well above the 10% standard that is our community's longstanding effort to care for all of our residents. Excuse me. The task force chose to study the need for and scarcity of modern market rate units, those that are unsubsidized and in most demand at the current time. We also review the city's plan of conservation and development. That was a very crucial study effort because we wanted to be sure that the investment at Riverside Avenue would connect with, with, excuse me, with downtown Bristol goals. And so without further ado, let me pass this over to Arthur Greenblatt, who is the CEO of the Vesta BHA joint venture. Arthur. Thank you very much, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, be, to be here. Um, I am the founder and now the president and CEO of Vesta Corporation. Um, we've been developing housing uh, since, since 1981. Um, my background in housing goes back to 1977 when I was general counsel at the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. Um, there is a relatively new type of, new type of housing uh, called workforce housing, which is, which is meant to be for um, municipal employees, teachers, fire personnel, police personnel, people starting, starting out, and, 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 and other people working in, in a community. Um, it's called workforce housing. So uh, one day, I called a uh, Mitzi Rowe from the, from the Housing Authority, whom I've known for over 20 years. Uh, she used to work for me several, several years ago and told her I was interested in taking a look at Bristol to see if there were any workforce housing opportunities. And we met and she said, I have just the building for you. And I'm glad she didn't show it to me that, that day because I don't know what I, what I would have done. Um, and, and, and I didn't know about all of the issues with the building, but the more I learned about it, the more I thought it would really be exciting to do and something that we would want to do and have had a lot of expertise in. Our, our first partnership with, with a city or a town was uh, started in 1983 with the town of, uh, of Manchester, Connecticut. We worked together and converted Bennett Junior High School uh, into, a, into, into housing, for, housing for the elderly. Um, Vesta is still involved with that today. We manage, we manage the property, property today. In fact, yesterday I, w I attended a meeting with, with the residents uh, to discuss some different things that were going on. Uh, one thing I wanted to do, which, I, which, which Mitzi and I accomplished, is we made it totally a, a, a local development team. Uh, the Bristol Housing Authority is a 50-50 partner with, with Vesta. Um, D'Amato Construction is going to be the contractor. Ed D'Amato was with us, with us tonight. And um, let's see, QA and M Architects, represented tonight by uh, um, by Justin Davis, is going to, going to be our architects. Uh, we're we're ready to get started. Unfortunately, it's going to take a while before you see any real real results because we have to deal with the the brownfields cleanup, which which could go on for an extensive period of time. But we're we're very anxious. There are going to be 91 apartments, uh, pretty much even split between one and two bedroom apartments. They're all going to be market rate apartments. We're estimating that that would be somewhere between eleven and fifteen hundred dollars out in two in 2022 when we think the first first units will become available. 
Um, so again, we're very, very excited to participate in this. In the, in this. And uh, even though uh, you're not going to be a written and an obligated partner, we view that the city of Bristol will be will be a, a partner of us because we'll we'll have to be working together, shoulder to shoulder, all the approvals we will need, and uh, and, and we're looking forward for continuing that relationship as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think the strength of your partnerships bode well for the future of this project, and we're looking forward to working with you. Riverside Avenue is a very critical corridor for us as it leads into downtown, and it's, it's going to be our focus for the next two to three years. As you develop your project, we'll be working with the other property owners there as well. Great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Do any members of the council have any questions concerning the session's proposal? Okay, there is a motion that has been prepared for us. Do you have a motion? I do. Okay. Um, I have it as a resolution, Your Honor. Yes. Be it hereby resolved to name Vesta BHA Joint Venture or its assigns as the preferred developer for the properties at 273 Riverside Avenue and 296 Riverside Avenue for purposes of redeveloping the properties to unsubsidized rental housing and to authorize the Office of Corporation Counsel to negotiate a tri-party agreement and any additional agreements with the Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank, Inc. and Vesta BHA Joint Venture for such housing plans and to effectuate the transfer of ownership of the properties to address environmental remediation at 273 Riverside Avenue and to conduct such redevelopment of the properties. Be it further resolved that this matter be referred to the Office of Corporation Counsel for necessary action. Is there a second for discussion purposes? Second. Any further discussion or questions from the council concerning moving forward with this resolution? Um, I have a question. So has it been discussed how the timeline will be relayed to people that are currently occupying the Sessions building. Do we have any idea of how that'll go? Uh, yes, to answer that question. So we're in close contact with many of the, the existing tenants in that building. And um, one thing that I always stress, so we've been working on this project for, so former Mayor Kuchur was in my office today talking about when he started on it. So it's been a long time, right? So. Multiple administrations have always been so supportive of this. Obviously, Mayor Zappo-Sasu as well. We've gone through some great staff members here at City Hall, so it's taken a while to get here. If there's a step one, we're still at step 0.5, right? Like, we have to get to the point where we work with the Connecticut Brownfield Land Bank. We need to be able to apply for grant funding to clean the property. So what we've told tenants, we, they, they are aware of what's happening the owner of the building is aware of what we're working towards. But we are a, a ways out. We want to be able to set up responsible programs on the city side to assist current tenants to be able to land somewhere great for them in the future. I think that the, they all understand and recognize our challenge here, but we're not going to leave them high and dry. We're setting up uh, programs. Uh, we're t like I said, we're talking with many of the tenants now, so um, I'm not, not going to let that happen. They're going to be placed appropriately. And so to be clear, because of our, our nature of social media and everything else, no one's being asked to vacate by February 1st. No, no. This, or March 1st. No. Or June 1st. No. Okay. Yeah, so we're, um, we're setting up appropriate programs. They'll be helped, uh, and we'll do it in a very appropriate way. Excellent. Thank you. And then I guess I have another question. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So can you please tell me why it's important that the Bristol Housing Authority is partnering with Vesta? Like, what does that give to the project that it wouldn't have if it was just a developer without the partnership? Yeah, so I mean, Bristol Housing Authority, so what we've sort of learned, and, and Marie was discussing it, uh, Bristol Housing Authority and other uh, similar organizations around the state, they don't have to do just one thing, right? And they're starting to branch out into different forms of housing. And what we know about uh, Bristol Housing Authority is they do run great housing developments in Bristol. We know them, right? So they want to step outside of that affordable housing box, the low-income housing box, and, in, and get into some more market rate developments. Vesta, at the same time, obviously, as, as, Ms., as Arthur um, mentioned, they're looking to do similar projects, which so has worked those two um, 
entities felt most comfortable together. Obviously, Mitzi and Bristol Housing Authority have the local flavor. Mm -hmm. D'Amato Construction, terrific city partner on a lot of different projects, know the community. So it really is kind of like the best of both worlds. Vesta is no joke. Vesta brings such a track record across the country um, about developing good properties, but they wanted that local, um, local flavor. And Bristol Housing Authority, D'Amato Construction, obviously the city, um, we bring that to the team. Awesome. Well, I'm at a liaison to the Housing Authority, so I know that they have a really great board and that there they're going to be yeah. you know, involved with making sure that this is going the way that fits the mm -hmm. needs of Bristol the best. So it's good to know, but I, I know it'll come up to me as a question from constituents, so I appreciate you clarifying. Yeah, what that Bristol does. Housing Authority mm -hmm. stepping up. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. I think it's important to, again, note that for social media purposes and for everybody leaving this meeting, that we hear a lot of terms. Uh, we hear affordable housing, we hear subsidized housing, we hear market rate housing. Everybody in this room heard tonight that the market rate rents are 1100 to $1,500 for these units proposed for 2022 when they come online. So when you hear that this is a low income project, please be aware that it is not. So. I think it's important to make that determination. We have a very storied past with some projects that have come before the council for downtown and elsewhere that were one thing, but were unfortunately labeled another. And talking about rabbit holes, those are the ones that we no longer have in front of us. I wanna be crystal clear about what the Sessions project is and what it isn't. And I think that we need to rely upon all of us as public policymakers, as well as our partners with the Bristol Housing Authority with D'Amato Construction, with our task forces, our boards and commissions, QAM, who's one of our partners now on this project, who are also with us on Memorial Boulevard, right across the river. It's really important that we all share that message. Don't let this project become something that it's not because of whatever type of toxicity or negativity exists in some aspects of our community. Is there anything else that anybody would like to add? I swear it's the last thing I'll say. <laughs> but I said this the last meeting too, and I feel like it's worth repeating that Every agenda item has a report or an attachment with it that you can click on online and read through. And this was really thoughtfully put together by the um, task force that was charged with reviewing this. Um, there's lots of great details in here, including some artist renderings that look really attractive and really ignited me to be excited about this project. So I would highly suggest that people reference those documents um, to get the visual and understanding of what's happening here. So thank you. Are there any other comments to come forward from the council members? Hearing none, this is a resolution and we will start on my right. Yes. 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 And the chair votes yes. Thank you. I'd also like to entertain a motion from a member of the council to disband the sessions task force and send them a letter of thanks for their hard work on this initiative. So moved. Second. Any other conversation? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Sorry. Motion carries. Thank you. Are there any other announcements from the City Council starting on my far right? Uh, I have none, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. I do not. <clears throat> Surprise, I have one. Um, so I'm not usually the type of person that writes things down, but there's something really important happening in my district that I felt was worth discussing, and I wanted to make sure that I covered every possible angle of it. Um, so in District 3, there's been a very important issue being circulated regarding application 2348, uh, which is currently being re reviewed by our Zoning Commission. This application is essentially asking to change an existing single family home zone to a multifamily zone on a proposed apartment complex. So there's a few things I'd like to mention. As your elected officials, we understand your frustration and concerns over the proposal. We've not made public comments regarding our own positions on this matter, not because I don't want to, or because we don't want to, but because we're not able to from an ethics perspective. Our zoning and planning commissions who are charged with reviewing and voting on these applications are comprised of citizens of Bristol, so your neighbors, who are appointed by city council. Since these folks are appointed by us, if we were to have public opinions on matters that are under their jurisdiction, it could be perceived as the council putting their finger on the scale or intimidating the commissioners into their decisions. 
For this reason, we have remained neutral, specifically Mary and I, who've received lots of phone calls and you know, questions about our support. And instead, we focused on facilitating requests when we receive uh, these requests for assistance and just for information purposes only. There are a couple things that we can help out with. So first, I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware that there's a special zoning meeting that's been rescheduled. For, uh, it was supposed to occur yesterday. It's been rescheduled to January 27th at 7 p.m. at Bristol Central High School. So just to clarify why the meeting was rescheduled, it was rescheduled for safety purposes at the direction of the police department. And just for transparency, land use meetings require advance notice. So for that reason, it needed to be moved at the time of the meeting yesterday. So just to kind of give some background, the first planning meeting that was given about this application drew about 40 people. The information meeting held last week that was at Man Ross Library that um, both Councilman Fortier, myself, and the mayor attended uh, drew about 150 people. It was very crowded and uh, we anticipated to see a big crowd yesterday, but being that the council chambers can hold up to 160 people, plus some standing space on the sides, uh, you know, we didn't know that it would exceed that capacity as well. So the chambers were filled to capacity, which prompted the change to the larger venue, which by law will require 12 days of advance notice. So just so you're aware, that's why it was like that. I know that from the outside perspective, it could appear that it should have been changed sooner, but. To be fair, I, I think the commission's done a great job of anticipating this to try to give the public an opportunity to speak. All right, so then now to the meat of the matter. Additionally, during the course of the application, we've heard many concerns about traffic. Mary and I have encountered these traffic concerns ourselves while walking in the neighborhood uh, for the campaign. We walked down Redstone Hill Road, and uh, I'm sure others in the audience may have done that too, and we noticed that the traffic concerns were real. So we felt that regardless of the application, uh, they needed to be addressed. So I want to make a referral to the Police Traffic Authority tonight, but before I do, um, Chief Gould, would you mind coming up and telling us a little bit about traffic radar speed feedback, feedback signs and what kind of data they can gather? So as he's approaching the podium, you want to make a motion to the traffic authority. Correct. I'm, I'm going to be moving to request the police traffic authority to deploy traffic radar speed feedback signs on Redstone Hill Road. So for discussion purposes in the form of a motion, is there a second? Second. Okay. Chief Gold. So thank you, Council. Uh, good evening. Um, so we have several different devices. Um, what our traffic uh, feedback devices typically do is they do a couple of things. Number one, they will alert people to what speed they are traveling at, so that acts as a deterrent. Um, so as they're approaching the sign, it will start to flash at a certain setting to let you know that you're going over the tolerance of the, the speed limit. Um, in addition to that stuff, it picks up traffic counts. Uh, we can uh, get as much as numbers of vehicles traveling on the road in either direction. Uh, we can look at various speeds. Um, we can look at the highest speeds obtained, the lowest speeds obtained, the mean speed, the 85th percentile. So it really provides us with a lot of information to give us a total, like uh, an idea of what's happening out there. Um, we typically concentrate on the 85th percentile. And what that is, is that's what 85% of the vehicles are traveling at. That speed, that's what's tolerated in the area. So by deploying those signs, uh, we can get a lot of feedback. Um, and it gives instant feedback to the community as well. Okay. I didn't know that they collected data. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So since they're going to be collecting data, how is that typically reviewed afterwards? Yep. Do you bring that to police board or? So we what we typically meeting? do is uh, our traffic division will collect all that data. They'll start to break it down and they break it all out. Um, and then we present it before the police commission and make any recommendations as to what we feel we need to do to address any concerns out there. Okay, great. So just so that I can inform the public, because as you've seen, Redstone Hill Road, there's a lot of attention on this traffic issue. Do you, can you notify the council of when, what police commission meeting you'll be bringing that to so that way? So we plan on having those traffic counters out as soon as possible. Okay. Um, it's a priority, it's gonna be a priority on our list. And um, I would imagine that, well, I'd like to look at the data first, but okay. I would be shooting for the most likely the February meeting. Awesome. Well, that exceeded my expectations, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. 
So just to be clear about a portion of what Councilwoman Barney noted from a land use perspective, I served on a land use board for about 10 years and the signage, the yellow signs that are part of our landscape when there are public hearings are actually part of the legal notice and that are posted appropriately so they become part of the legal package of the meeting. The signs that were posted on Redstone Hill Road advertised last night as the legal noticed meeting. They could not on a whim after Thursday night change that, even if it was as easy as some people think to get a high school auditorium, which it's not. So last night had to happen in order to open that public hearing for another variety of legal issues, and then in order to repost and have as proper that part of the legal notice. So people who think that it's as easy as changing a shine or that it's shameful that we didn't do it ahead of time really don't understand the process. So with that being said, let's vote on the motion to refer to the Police Traffic Authority, the matter of Redstone Hill Road, and the traffic issues accompanying it. Also, for the record, we've had the DMV Truck Enforcement Unit there because of the perceived actions of the neighbors concerning what they believe to be increased traffic because of the cut through aspect of Route 10 to Route 229 and the industrial factors there. That's already in play, and they'll be back visiting Redstone Hill Road probably very soon as they make their rotation through Bristol. So, all in favor of the motion as presented by Councilwoman Barney? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Councilman Forty, any announcements? None for me, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna be quick with a couple of updates because they happened um, yesterday and I wasn't really able to reach all the council members or do an email. Uh, some of you may have seen I had a surprise visitor at the end of the business day yesterday. Governor Lamont stopped in on his way back from a meeting in Waterbury. We talked about a variety of topics. I thanked him for the open space grant, which all of you may have seen because it's um, garnered some good media coverage in the Bristol Press. We received an $850,800 grant that we'll be sharing with the Environmental Learning Centers who's looking to obtain roughly 28 acres in Burlington adjacent to the Barnes Nature Center where we're looking to um, acquire about 30 acres on the Bristol side. So. Scott Heth, the Environmental Learning Center's director and I traveled to DEP yesterday and we talked with that staff about some of the technical issues associated with having two entities um, share a grant. So that is moving forward and we'll be working with NTH, the owners of that property, over the next few months. Prior to that, several of us were in Naugatuck for a rail conference, and I actually had someone reach out on my Facebook page and say, why in the world would you be going to Naugatuck for a rail conference? You're the mayor of Bristol. So it's an interesting question, and I will just spend a minute letting everybody know that about five years ago, uh, when I was on the city council and we debated which council of governments to join, we had a very spirited debate. And we decided as a council in the former administration to join Naugatuck Valley as opposed to Capital Region because of our interest in furthering Bristol's opportunities to get to New York and Western points, mostly because of the ESPN employees, but also others who make it um, a habit to go there both for work and pleasure. And we thought that the Waterbury branch line that runs into the Naugatuck Valley was our best opportunity. That is actually coming to fruition, which is why I went to Naugatuck and was joined by other CEOs of our 19 member Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments, as well as all of the legislature uh, members who actually represent those towns, including Senator Martin, who joined us for that roundtable. So some interesting quick facts that they are looking to initiate planning on the feasibility of extending passenger rail service north to Thomaston and Torrington and also between Berlin and Bristol. Some of you may remember who follow these types of issues that this was previously deemed not feasible. Uh, the Naugatuck Valley and the studies that have come out of our planning cog are saying that's not necessarily true. And with some side compartments which allow trains to bypass each other, that this might actually be a reality. So we went in support of that and to really talk to the legislature about the transportation funding aspects, especially adding rail cars. So that was a, a first meeting, and I think it's one that um, will hopefully prove to be fruitful for Bristol in the next few years. 
I mentioned the open space grant. We're very excited about that. That also is a subject of um, about a year's worth of work. And I did want to commend the staff that were associated with that because uh, we scored very high in that um, ranking for all the grants that came in across the state. So that bodes well for future applications as well. And I just would like to end my announcements by personally thanking Deputy Chief Sayogas for putting together tonight's um, celebration of Chief Kalakowski's court. It was very touching, and it, you could tell when he entered the building, it was very emotional for him. So thank you for doing that, and please extend the thanks to the department as well. Okay, moving on to our consent calendar. We have items 5A through H that we have under consideration. And I'd first like to ask if there's any items on the consent calendar that anybody would like to have withdrawn so that we can have further conversation about them. Your Honor, if, if council doesn't have any requests, um, I would ask that 5G be pulled off just to remove the public hearing and assessment. It's not necessary for an acceptance, a street acceptance. So we're gonna move item 5G off of the consent calendar and we'll deal with that separately. Anything else? Hearing none, is there a motion to come before us to approve consent calendar A through H, excluding G? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So at the town clerk's recommendation, we're going to refer the acceptance of Graham Street, connecting West Street to Summit Street to the Planning Commission, Board of Public Works, yes, and that's that, it? That's it. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to reports and committee reports. Uh, we have two items from the Ordinance Committee, and I believe Councilman Hahn will be handling that. Yes, Your Honor. I have a, a proposed amendment to the Code of Ordinance pertaining to Article uh, 8, Bristol Development Authority and Bristol Downtown Development Corporation, and Article <coughs> 14, Enterprise Zone Assessments. Uh, for my first motion would be to uh, waive the reading in accordance with Section 21F of the Charter of the City of Bristol. I hereby move that the reading of the proposed amendments to the Code of Ordinances to be introduced this date pertaining to Article 8, Bristol Development Authority and Bristol Downtown Development Corporation and Article 14, Enterprise Zone Assessments. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And the follow uh, to introduce in, in accordance with 21F of the Charter of the City of Bristol, the following amendments to the Code of Ordinance are hereby introduced. I hereby move that at that the time and place of Tuesday, February 4th, 2020, at 4.30 p.m. in the first floor meeting room, City Hall, 111 North Main Street, Bristol, Connecticut, be set for the holding of a public hearing thereon by the Ordinance Committee and that the city clerk publish notice of said public hearing and propose amendments to the code of ordinances as required by the city charter. So this is section 18-180 through 118-204 for yes. the Bristol Development Authority? Yes. Okay, the motion has been made. May I have a second for conversation? Second. Okay, with that being said, I'd like to ask Commissioner Howard Schmelder to come to the podium as the longest serving member of the Bristol Development Authority, previously known as the Redevelopment Agency. I thought it would be appropriate for him to kind of give an oversight of what we're trying to do with the change of name. Thank you, Mayor. Pleasure to be here. Uh, every time I sit up there at a BDA meeting, I look back there, and I have served now under 14 mayors. I've been on the Bristol Development Authority now for over 40 years, been born in Bristol, so I have a lot of history. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that history of how we started back in 1958. Uh, I had not started to work yet, I was still in school. Uh, that's when the Bristol De Redevelopment Agency was put into play to begin <laughs> urban renewal in downtown Bristol. In 1983, I became a commissioner somewhere in the 70s. I don't know the exact year, but in 1983, the redevelopment agency was replaced by the new Bristol Development Authority. Uh, this new authority came into result as a, because of the completion of our redevelopment of downtown Bristol. By the way, I, I saw that 
the ashes, the buildings up, I saw the buildings come down, I saw the buildings go up, I saw the buildings go down, <laughs> and I'm so pleased I'm still alive to see the Bristol Hospital and the revitalization of what's happening downtown. So I've, I've lived long enough to see all that. Uh, but the new authority came into being a result of the completion of the redevelopment and was charged with the continuing economic development and the responsibility of the CDG program. The best kept secret around is CDBG, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Since 1983, many new programs and opportunities for business growth and expansion have been added to the tool chest of the Bristol Development Authority. We now focus on both business growth of Bristol and our socioeconomic programs that benefit the quality of life for our residents. Our grant programs have expanded to include workforce development, residential housing rehab, which I'm proud to have been an advocate for millions of dollars that have been put back in so our residents can remain in their homes and not move into nursing homes, et cetera, that they can maintain their properties here in Bristol. Social services agencies, in addition to support of business expansion, locations and new construction, streetscape initiatives completed in the downtown area, the West End, and Forestville, which I happen to be a part of. I was born in Forestville, which, if some of you know Phil Jasalowitz, who's no longer with us, it was called the Intellectual Center of Bristol. <laughs> but I'll let that pass. <laughs> We've had facade improvement grants that have really helped businesses. Uh, our Enterprise Zone, which I was part of when that was formed. Our Work Opportunity Zones, our Small Business Grants, the Startup Bristol Program, in addition to the creative financing opportunities such as the TIF program that you recently approved. Uh, uh, just to mention a few of the programs that did not exist when it was uh, the redevelopment agency or even the beginning of the Bristol Development Authority. The CDBG programs, which I'm proud to have been the policy chair on that for many, many years, directly, directly affects the quality of life within the city, along with the public facilities and improvements that we, we've made dramatic impacts for our residents and our businesses. Now to the reason for I went to speak for myself and the other commissioners, well, why should we change them at the Bristol Development Authority? And this was what a commissioner said the other night at our meeting. At times when I or other commissioners mentioned that we serve on the board of the Bristol Development Authority, we get asked, what do you do? What do you develop, right? So I think that acronym and the word, and the mayor talked about this, and I agree with her, uh, the connotation of authority to me has a very negative connotation. So the name change to the Economic and Community Development Board will more clearly define the changing role of the BDA, as well as the use of the perceived perception of the word authority. Having been a commissioner for 40 years, I've seen significant change in the scope and the focus of many activities of the board. Quality of life programs and creative business development tools have greatly added to the flexibility and creativity needed to continue a solid growth in attracting both new businesses and residents while continuing to support programs that benefit our current residents and our current businesses. I support the name change. I think when, you, when we say economic and community development, it clearly delineates what we're really all about in the city of Bristol. With that, I thank you. Thank you for, again, serving under Mayor Ellen. It's been a joy. I've enjoyed it. I think I've contributed to the city of Bristol. And I've got to work with a lot of fine people. And it's a great city. I love it. I think I'm the fifth generation of Schmelders in this town. And I'm happy to be here to speak with you. Does anybody have any questions of me? Does if anybody not, have any questions of Commissioner Schmelder based on the BDA recommendation and endorsement of no, this name change? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that great summary. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> and all your service as well. Yes. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are set down for a public hearing to change that name. Uh, uh, Councilman Han, you have one more item. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, in regards to proposed amendments to code of ordinances, ordinances pertaining to Chapter 16, Parks and Recreation, I first have a motion to waive reading in accordance with Section 21F of the Charter of City of Bristol. I hereby move that the reading of the proposed amendments to the code of ordinances be introduced this they pertaining to Chapter 16, Parks and Recreation. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And to follow the motion to introduce, in accordance with Section 21F of the Charter of the City of Bristol, the following amendments to the Code of Ordinances are hereby introduced. I hereby move that the time and place 
of Tuesday, February 4th, 2020 at 4.40 p.m. in the first floor meeting room, City Hall, 111 North Main Street, Bristol, Connecticut, be set for the holding of a public hearing thereon by the Ordinance Committee and that the City Clerk publish notice of said public hearing and proposed amendments to the Code of Ordinances as required by the City Charter. Second. Okay, so discussion on this item. The Parks and Recreation Community and Youth Services Department is recommending that the city follow suit with um, some national recommendations from the National Park and Rec Association to adopt a ban of tobacco products in city parks. So this will be the subject of a public hearing on the date as indicated by Councilman Hahn. Does anybody have any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I believe there is a item from the real estate committee that we need to bring onto the table. Yes, Your Honor, I move to add the item to the agenda for the real estate committee. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Your Honor, I have a motion. I hereby move that the City of Bristol enter into a rental lease by and between the City of Bristol landlord and Exterior Trim Specialties LLC tenant for city-owned property known as 296 Riverside Avenue, Bristol, Connecticut. The lease shall be a month-to-month -month tenancy. The total rent paid by the tenant shall be $600 per month and the property shall only be utilized for storage by the tenant. The lease shall contain a 60-day termination clause. I further move that this matter be referred to the Corporation Council to prepare and or review any necessary documents. I further move that the mayor or acting mayor be authorized to execute any necessary documents to effectuate the same. Second. Discussion. So some of you may be aware that we had a long-term tenant in there that had a lease agreement. Uh, we have asked them to vacate in preparation for the sessions building uh, redevelopment. But meanwhile, we have interest from someone who is willing to enter into a month to month where we can still have some income coming into the city. So that is in fact uh, what the real estate committee is putting forward. So does anybody have any other questions concerning this matter? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, other committee reports starting on my far left. Done for me. Um, I just wanted to say for the library board um, that, that there's Sunday hours, in case that anyone wasn't aware already, um, through March 22nd from 1 to 5 p.m. There are Sunday hours at the Bristol Library. Check out their Facebook page for lots of great events that they're offering. They're trying to draw crowds there on Sundays with some, some new and exciting uh, programs for children and for adults. So check out their Facebook for more information or contact the library. And that's it. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to combine school readiness and the Board of Education. Um, Dawn Nielsen, the mayor and myself, recently attended an award ceremony for the uh, Bristol Education Foundation, their mini-grant program. And it, it was quite impressive, their, the dedication and creativity and passion of the teachers that won these grants was pretty evident. and. Uh, if, if being a Bristol resident, I, I was very confident in seeing the, um, the passion and just the talent of these teachers. Uh, $15,000 total in grants were awarded to 15 different teachers, and it really enhances the educational system and also um, removes some, remove some of the financial burden because this is money that doesn't have to come from our budget. And speaking of that, since 1991, a total of four, over $415,000 has been awarded, and that's quite substantial. And I'd like to give you a brief history of the foundation. It actually started as the Bristol Mentor Program by Fred Soliani in 1991. And uh, Howard is nodding, he's aware of that. And the way it initially was structured was a school would, it, would be adopted by a nearby business. They would provide mentors and financial support, which is normally in the form of a check, two, three, being written yearly. But with the advent of 501c3s, 
becoming the preferred way of charitable giving, we are fortunate in that we had three iconic Bristolites at the helm at that point, and they are John Leone, Bob Mercier, and John Smith. Now, Howard, you're an iconic Bristolite. Did you have a hand in that as well? No, but I was a mentor. Of oh, okay. I, I knew you were involved somewhere. But we were fortunate in their leadership being in place at that point because it was really rather seamless. And the foundation is still strong to this day. And since I spoke of the Education Foundation actually uh, being a tentacle of the mentoring program, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Janine Audette, who ran both for a significant amount of time. And when Janine retired two years ago, there were 170 mentors working in the Bristol public school system. So they, they are both very strong organization and one feeds the other. Uh, insofar as school readiness, um, this, this is repeated yearly, but it's very important. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a concerted effort by all center and faith-based programs to ensure all children experience a seamless transition from preschool to kindergarten because the importance of that is that there is notable um, improved academic achievement when this happens. There's positive social emotional skills exhibited by the students and there are few, fewer behavioral problems that surface, which means learning is much easier. So please, if anyone out there has anyone that is in uh, pre-K or knows of family, families that are stress the importance of this transition. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. I'd like to, uh, from the Board of Police, uh, recognize Officer Colby Vaccarello, who will be graduating the Police Academy uh, this Friday on January 17th. We look forward to having him join our force. On January 30th, we'll be kicking off our Parks and Recreation plan. Superintendent Medeiros will be attending the 10-year Capital Improvement Committee that evening to provide an update on the master planning process. Parks and Recs is very busy. Registration for the winter spring programs are underway. The department is offering a wide variety of activities for the entire family. Please visit www.bristolrec.com to view the available programs and register today. An update on the Page Park pool. Renovations continue to move forward on time and on budget. Staff continue to work closely with the construction team in order to keep the project on track for summer 2020 grand reopening. I'd like to uh, mention a little something about the opioid task force. While the mayor's task force continues to become a wealth of resources, it's, it's great to see the pieces coming together. Please visit our city's website at www.bristolct.gov for further information on the opioid crisis we face today. There you'll learn about our city's Bristol Recoveries Alliance, otherwise known as COBRA, have direct links to various services, and view our very own public service announcements. That's all I have. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Councilman Hahn. I have no further reports. Thank you. Moving on to unfinished business, uh, we have charter revision for 2020 before us. And um, under unfinished business, we are going to actually have the resolution to form charter revision. And then I will name the commission members under the appointment section. So Councilman Kelly, I believe you have the resolution. Yes, I do, Your Honor. Be it hereby resolved that pursuant to authority contained in section 7-187 through 7-190 of the Connecticut General Statutes, the City Council of the City of Bristol hereby creates a Charter Re Revision Commission to consist of seven electors to be nominated by the mayor and confirmed by the City Council, provided that no more than one third of whom may hold any other public office in this city and not more than a bare majority of whom shall be members of any political party. Said commission is hereby directed to make its draft to the appointing authority on or before April 13th, 2021. 
Okay, is there a second? Second. So just to be clear, we are empowering this Charter Revision Commission to go the full length that it's allowed by law, which is 16 months, in the hopes that they can have a very substantive review of the charter in general. Uh, that will mean that we will be on schedule to be on the November 2021 ballot, which is more appropriate for municipal action items as opposed to our presidential year and will allow the Charter Revision Commission more time. Any other questions? Hearing none, this is a resolution, and we will start on my far right. Yes. 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 And the chair votes yes. The resolution is approved. Thank you. We're moving to item nine, which is resignations. And there are five resignations, Your Honor. The first is from Sarah Mangifico from the Board of Fire Commissioners. The second is from Dennis Siriani from the Energy Commission. The third is from Donna Papazian from the Board of Library Directors. The fourth is from William, Cun William Cunningham from the Zoning Commission. And the last one is from David White from the Planning Commission. Thank you. Uh, an appropriate motion would be to accept the letters of resignation and have them placed on file, as well as have letters of thanks generated to those that have served, two of whom are leaving posts due to health issues and have had, um, all of them have contributed greatly over the past several years. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're up to appointments, and there are several. I'd like to thank uh, the members of the council who have helped me fill some of these longstanding ones. And we are close to being at full capacity on many of these boards. The first one is the City Energy Commission, and it is to appoint Jack Ferraro to replace Dennis Siriani, who has resigned for an unexpired term to January of 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is the Board of Fire Commissioners, and it is to appoint Dennis Crispino, a Republican, to replace Sarah Mangifico, resigned on 12-17-19 for a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Freedom of Information Advisory Board is to reappoint Josh Zachary Blacker for a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. On the Bristol Historic District Commission, the motion is to appoint Cameron Crowell to replace Brittany Barney, alternate member, due to her resignation upon being elected, five-year term to January 2025. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There is still an alternate member vacancy on this board. That must be an unaffiliated Republican or independent minor party member. For the Board of Library Commissioners, there are three reappointments. The first is to reappoint Valina Carpenter, who is currently serving as our chair of the Library Board of Commissioners, to a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The second is to reappoint Andrea Kapchensky to a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The third appointment to reappoint Nicholas Jakubowski to a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And the fourth, which is a new appointment to replace Donna Papazian, is Lacia Stewart Roman for an unexpired term to January of 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is to appoint Tracy Backus to replace David White, resigned on the Planning Commission for an unexpired term to July of 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
Bristol Transportation Commission to reappoint Donald Padlow a three-year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. To reappoint Dave Hartley is the next one, also Bristol Transportation Commission, senior citizen at large member for a three year term to January of 2023. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And for the Zoning Commission, to appoint David White to replace William Cunningham, resigned, an unexpired term to June of 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry to see my friend Lexi Mangum leave early because tonight we have appointed three African Americans to boards, which I think is a record for the city council and one that we can continue to expand upon. For a charter revision, we have seven names. Uh, we have John Fitzgerald, the chair of the previous Charter Revision Commission, um, as well as several before that, um, as a Republican member coming back. Jonathan Mace, a Republican member coming back. Uh, Lori Scotty, a Democratic member coming back. John Jack Krampitz, a Democrat who will be returning. John Lafreniere, an unaffiliated voter who's joining Charter Revision after his tenure on the Bristol Development Authority. And two new members, Richard Carter, a Democrat, and Roman Suchta, a Republican, for seven members. And I'd like to ask that they be impaneled and appointed. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Why are you looking at me? Yes? because I didn't think there was any. Was there new business that I was unaware of? My Not for me. resolution was under new business. But you did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are done with appointments, and um, I will turn the running of the agenda over to our town and city clerk for items 11 through 13, and then we'll take up our executive session items. Item 11, resolution regarding Senior Volunteer Tax Relief Pilot Program for 2019-2020 and to waive the reading of the resolution but to include it as part of the minutes. And there is a resolution to read. Oh, actually you don't want to read it, you want to waive it. <laughs> we want to waive the reading. Yeah, right. it's a long one. Yeah, so the, if someone could just take the motion that is embedded. Um, I just don't know how to do that when we're waiving the reading. Just approve. I make a motion to approve the um, Senior Volunteer Tax Relief Pilot Program for 2019-20 and to waive the, waive the reading of the resolution. Okay. Second. Does that meet the requirements, Teresa? It does. Okay. Any questions or concerns about this? Is everybody aware and everybody was able to read the backup? It's been a very successful program over the last several years, and it's actually uh, more people have been joining it every year, which is good to see. With no other questions or concerns, a motion to approve for the resolution. We will start on my left. Yes. 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 Chair votes yes. The resolution is approved. <clears throat> Item 12, to authorize the mayor to sign any and all lot SIP grant funding applications to construct sidewalks on Shrub Road and a portion of Jerome Avenue, Shrub Road to Stevens Street. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, yes, Your Honor, if I may. Um, the Shrub Road, uh, there's been some talk about the Shrub Road effort um, and the safety with the pedestrians as well as uh, homeowners in the area coming out from their, their driveways. I, I want to stress that no decisions have been made. Some people have voiced concern or support for uh, several ways to alleviate the problems on Shrub Road, but I want to make clear that there have been no decisions made as of yet. We're still in, in, in looking at the issues and the best way to accommodate. This is simply, uh, uh, we need time to look for the funding, for instance, for this grant application, uh, for the possibility of, of sidewalks. 
but it's, it's, we're looking at going forward and to working with the residents in the area to get this resolved uh, in the best way. Uh, so I just want to stress that there are no decisions being made as of yet. It's the step one of a grant process to identify funding to possibly do the project. So thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so the motion has been made and it's been seconded. Do, does anybody have any other questions concerning this motion to authorize me for lots of grant funding? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 13, to approve a real property tax assessment fixing agreement for Tobacco and Sons Builders Incorporated, contingent on its purchase and occupancy of 126 Burlington Avenue. So moved. Second. Discussion? I thought I saw Mr. Tobacco here earlier. Yeah, he oh, okay. So this was good news for the city that the um, master, former Master Batisto site, which is on Route 69, is going to be reclaimed and will allow Mr. Tobacco and his uh, business associates to have more room, as well as potentially be opening space on Stafford Avenue at his current facility for existing businesses that need to move into that space. Justin, is there anything you want to add to the motion or discussion? Does anybody have any questions concerning this? No, I, great job. I mean, we've done these before, but it's a nice incentive to, incentive to offer companies like tobacco, great local company. They can't grow right now where they are. They literally can't hire more personnel because they don't have an area to park those folks. They can't grow their equipment base. This allows them to do that. And they're going to take a what has been a starting to be a deteriorated yeah. site, and it's it's something that is very visible on Route 69, and I think they're going to do a very nice job with renovating it. Yep. Okay. There's no further questions. A motion to approve has been made, and it's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have three executive sessions in front of us, items 14, 15, and 16. And for the record, I'd like to ask Corporation Counsel Clift to let us know who will be joining us on all of those. Okay, with respect to all of those, uh, I, we've all in our office have had a hand in most of these, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna bring all of us in, um, the Corporation Counsel's office on all of those executive sessions. And then with respect to number 16 in the matter of um, Thomas Levine uh, will be joined by attorney Eric Bartlett. Uh, I would uh, suggest that we first uh, handle the copper mine properties first. It mm -hmm. should be a fairly quick matter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the one on uh, 16, Thomas Levine, since we have outside counsel here as a courtesy to him, and then uh, we'll take the other two, or the other one, pardon me, the other one. Okay. So is there a motion to convene into <clears throat> executive session? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. These appear to be executive sessions that will be very quickly executed, so for those who may be interested in their outcome, we will be back out shortly. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Please let the record show that no votes were taken in executive session. Are there any motions to come before the council? Should we go in order of agenda items? Sure. We'll go with number 14 first. That's fine, right? I hereby move that the city of Bristol enter into a full, mo full and final settlement in the matter of J. Kolokowski versus city of Bristol, WC number 6010813369 in consideration of a payment of $125,000. I further move that the corporation council or assistant corporation council be authorized to e execute any necessary documents to effectuate the settlement in that the matter be referred to the Board of Finance for any necessary funding. Second. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Aye. Item 15. I hereby move that the City of Bristol enter into a settlement in the matter of City of Bristol versus Copper Mine Properties, LLC, Docket number HHB CV 1660354 s in consideration of a payment 
by the defendant of $25,000. I further move that the Corporation Counsel or Assistant Corporation Counsel be authorized to execute any necessary documents to effectuate the settlement. Is there a second? Second. 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 Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 16. Uh, can I just confirm with the attorney that the WCC number on the agenda is the correct one? The motion says 369, and I think that's Mr. Kolakowski's, correct? Yes, yes it is. Right. So, so it should be the one on the agenda. I just wanted to double check. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So I hereby move that the city of Bristol enter into a full and final settlement in the matter of Thomas Levine versus city of Bristol, WCC number 6010598283, in consideration of a payment of $100,000. I further move that the Corporation Council, Assistant Corporation Council, or McGann, Bartlett, and Brown as counsel for the City of Bristol be authorized to execute any necessary documents to effectuate the settlement and that the matter be referred to the Board of Finance for any necessary funding. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Is there any other business to come before the City Council tonight? Hearing none, a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Very efficient meeting considering what we transacted tonight, everybody.